everyone. Welcome back to the Earthbound Survival Guide, a podcast for novices and masters alike. I am Dan. My co-host is, of course, Josh. Good evening, everybody. There you go. That's your version of Good Morning Vietnam. <laughs> That's just me putting on my, my radio, radio announcer DJ. voice. Exactly. We're coming to you live. Recorded somewhere in the past. We are, on tonight's podcast, going to talk about all things financial and numerical, because we're going to get to threads, uh, and threadical, I guess, I don't know. Uh, it's a grab critical? bag tonight. Yeah. It so is. It's, uh, it's but a... first, we're going to get to some emails, because some people decided to actually email us and ask us a couple of, or one asked a question, one wants a shout out, we're going to give them both. The, uh, but the, a few. The, the elite group of people who email us, and if you'd like yes. to join that elite group of people. Look at you and your radio expertise. That email address is edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Yes. We do read all the emails that we receive, and we have, in yes. fact, I think pretty much shared uh, almost all of them that we have gotten. There have yes. been one or two that were, like, directed to that email address that were, like, specific questions, like, about the, like, a recent Kickstarter that I didn't bother doing on here. But for the most on part, there, no. You know, no, we mentioned the Kickstarter regardless of the email or not. So yes, but Iopos is out. So yeah, speaking, I was going to say, speaking of the Kickstarter, <laughs> Iopos is out. Um, if people have not noticed, seen the seen page one hundred and five of Don Higgins's Earth Dawn mm-hmm. webcomic Champions Challenge, yes. there was a bit of a bomb, bomb that shell? went off in <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, that was now that, sort of as this is going page. up actually a couple of weeks ago. Can I say it? Can I say it? Yes. Ool is dead. Ool is dead. <laughs> this is more details will be forthcoming. And maybe by the time this release releases will have already come out, but I'm not going to talk about it here. This is connected to the oft rumored and frequently denied super secret project. <laughs> the big, big secret. <laughs> um, the big, big secret, the super secret project. Like I said, more details will be forthcoming. This is something that we have been working on and a long uh, time. setting up dominoes and putting things into place for for this. And I am excited and I, I hope everybody else is, too. Yeah. More information on that in the future. Pay attention to so. our uh, various social media platforms. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Follow FASA Games on Facebook. Visit our Discord. Visit our forums. FASAGames.com. Yeah, FASAGames.com. Mm-hmm. All sorts of places where you can keep up on the latest news and information about FASA Games. And all yeah, of the fine products that we on... release. Including, yes. once he finishes it up, we will be doing a print version of Champions Challenge Volume 1 in its entirety. Uh, it is going to be, or will very shortly be wrapping up. It's uh, its first volume run online. Mm-hmm. You'll be taking a little bit of a hiatus, but we will be putting together a, a print version of that. If you want to get it, keep an eye out for that news. I will be the first buyer. Yes. Iopos uh, is out and more news and information and exciting stuff forthcoming. So please uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. So to the emails. To the emails. First one from Kendall. What's up, luminaries and legends? Does that mean we're both luminaries and both legends? Or are you the legends and I'm the luminary? Or how does that work? Uh, I don't know. I'll accept it, though. Okay, yeah, I will as well. I'm, I'm okay with that. Any compliments you want to send our way, we'll read. Uh, it's your friend, uh, Vlolk here, Sky Reader of the Seventh Circle and brother of the Path of the Horror Stalkers. And I'd like to say I love the show. Well, I think Thank you just did, so uh, we'll take that. Sadly, there aren't too many podcasts about Earth Dawn, so I thought I w- it would behoove me to let you guys know about another, another live one out there, and maybe you could shout it out for other listeners on your show. Also, thanks for the advertising you gave to the West Marches group. The influx of friends, fresh victims, has been wonderful. Keep up the good work. And thank you, Kendall. We certainly shall. Yes. So, listennotes.com and type in name givers. There's two N's in listennotes.com. Just type in the yep. word name givers, that podcast come right up we, for you. Yeah, we, we mentioned this podcast actually last week on the show, yes. um, that this was a new actual play podcast. I think as of this recording, they've got six episodes posted with yep. more on the way. I have not personally had a chance to listen to any of them yet because my podcast listening ability is somewhat limited and I'm trying to keep up on some stuff. I'll get to it quick. 
Yeah. They got about like five, you know, six episodes, five and a half hours or so. And I think there's there's no preamble where music just get in, talk about your characters, and let's yeah. go. And I just need to find the time to work that one into my um, yeah, yeah, relaxing absolutely. schedule. <laughs> so thank you, Kendall. Yep. Uh, so, so yeah, no, that's, that is cool. So second email comes from K Scott, K period, Scott. Uh, hey guys, I'm glad to see your podcast is still going well, as are we. I'm surprised yes. every day that we keep doing this. It's amazing. I try to listen every week. Guess what? So do we. <laughs> you just listened to episode 29, Elementalists, and thought of a question. With the reintroduction of the shaman discipline in Mystic Paths, which we'll get to, by the way, mm -hmm. the majority of spellcasters can now summon spirits. I'm assuming he means three out of the five. Yeah. So it's majority, technically. What would you say to players of wizards and illusionists who feel left out and want to also summon spirits? They should have played another Mancer Elementalist or Shaman. <laughs> that was my answer. Um, he's personally fine with not all spellcasters being able to summon spirits, but do yeah. you find this at all unfair or unbalancing? No. I don't either. I don't, because we'll talk about spirits another time. I've not got it in this slated episode. in the, it is, the it list is slated somewhere. To be, yeah. I mentioned when we talked about Elementalist that I have thoughts about about. Spirits, and I want to focus like a whole we'll show on We'll do a whole, whole episode on we'll summoning whole, and spirits. A whole, Trust a whole me. show on, on spirits and summoning and all that. No, because those don't play into the flavor or style of the illusionist or wizard. You know, if you can certainly... No, I just... it It's... I agree. No. It's not been something that's ever part of... Been part of their thing. It's not, it's not in their kit. The illusionist is more worried about the sleight of hand illusionary fooling people around you. They don't have a, the need to contact or draw forth any kind of spirits because spirits are not deceptive in any way, shape or form like the illusions right. are. So I don't find that in their, their bag of tricks. I don't find that in their philosophy. Wizards. Wizards get a lot, but I mean, yeah, you know, like you look at, at what wizards get in terms of the talents and spells that they have that are disciplined for them. And some of them might be available to, to other magician disciplines, but the wizard is the manipulator of pure, magical energy um yeah, like in I terms of what as... they can do with with uh things like astral interference and the spell to counter it and like all sorts of things like like that that allowing all magicians to summon spirits one like how do you prevent that from treading on the toes of other disciplines do you create additional classes of spirits that are unique to those disciplines like you did for the like shaman. we did with like we did with the with the beast spirits for for shaman um in mm -hmm. fourth edition that feels wrong uh, okay so but no i mean basically my feeling is that wizards and illusionists get other stuff to play with and if a character, if a player wants to do stuff with spirits, they should choose a discipline that does stuff with spirits. Yeah, I, I also right. I mean, it's it like it 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 almost feels like saying, oh, my troubadour isn't as good at fighting as a swordmaster. Why isn't my troubadour as good at fighting as a swordmaster? Because he's not a swordmaster. If you wanted to be good <laughs> at fighting, play a swordmaster or a warrior yes. or an air mm -hmm. sailor. You are or playing you a troubadour. Play, if you want to play the jack of all trades, play the human with versatility, and there you yeah. are. Um, I mean, you you can't, but it you know it it's like asking, you know, why isn't my weaponsmith as good at ranged weapons as the archer? Mm -hmm. Because the weaponsmith isn't an archer. Yes. Like there, I mean, d disciplines are things. They have a focus. They have a theme. They have an idea that they are playing into. And, and this is their way of life. Yeah. And again, when it comes to spirits, because spirits bring something good, potentially troublesome mm -hmm. to the table. You know, I just I just like and, I, and I'm not saying that that our listener here is implying this in, in any way, shape or form. No. OK. OK, Scott, you asked a great question. But just yeah, no, it's it's I mean, it's it's a it's a fair question. It's more along the lines of. Everybody like has their niche preferred. To fill. Well, everybody has their niche to fill, but every player has their favorite discipline. Mm -hmm. And I can understand the desire for one's favorite discipline to be the most awesome, broadly speaking, however you choose to define that. But at the same time, 
we need to make sure that other people's favorite disciplines are also just as awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Are also just as but awesome. But not more so awesome because, than the one because you Because we awesome. don't want players we, – we don't want – like with looking at an eye towards overall balance and we don't always get this perfect. And some of this depends on the style of play and, and the game and what is being done at the particular table and so many other factors that we don't have any control over. But to look at that and say, we don't want a situation where say one discipline, when you get to a certain point overshadows everybody, right? If we give, you know, all sorts of tools and tricks and abilities that allow, you know, especially when you start looking at magicians and you start talking about spells, which gives them an increased amount of versatility and ability to do things. If we give them spells that end up duplicating the talents of other disciplines, and so through spells, a magician might be able to be as effective in combat as a warrior... Well, why would you then play a warrior? Because then when you get to that point, if the if the spellcaster is overshadowing the warrior, what you know, so you can do everything the warrior can do and cast spells and have additional tools and tricks on top of it. Like mm -hmm. that doesn't seem cool to, to me, to the people who want to play warriors, who want to play that like martial artist combat type. And you know, there are decisions that are made that are that that might not necessarily be 100 percent in line with some particular view of how the setting works. But it's also we're we're not just creating a setting for stories like if we were just writing novels or producing movies or comics or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. We would be able to. Like kind of set whatever balance and and things that that we wanted, but this is also a game where we need to take into account that different people have different desires and different goals, and that we want to make it so that at least broadly the choices that they make are varied and interesting, and whatever kind of avenue somebody wants to take is to one extent or another supported and and made and recognized as worthwhile um you know within within the broader framework of our mission in terms of what we're looking at for the overall goal of the game and the setting like we will as far as i am concerned we won't ever really support stuff that allows the the playing of of evil characters there can be dark stuff there can be, mm -hmm. you know, villains and, and there's horror undercurrents and things like that. But that's not like we're going to make stuff that is that interests us yeah. and is interesting to us. And frankly, like there's enough anti-hero villainous stuff out there that is available to people. Vigilante. That's not in the th that's not the theme of the players version. The players involvement in earth dawn you're there to be the heroes and save the land right and now that's know. now that's not that's not saying that i mean for crying out loud we just put out the iopos book <laughs> I, i'm like I'm, I'm i'm going on this thing and i'm saying i just we just put out the iopos book which does have some pages in it dedicated to playing agents of the denerastus yes. which if you are going to like that is probably the closest that that we would be to like playing to author villainous characters so like i you know i i'm i'm thinking you know uh, uh along this like yeah you know what i just kind of went on this whole thing about not wanting to play bad guys but we just released a book that has you know is you to dedicated to the city of the bad guys and has some advice on playing bad guys and what you might be doing and that's the first time in 27 years well, no, I mean <laughs> you could you could you could i mean it was certainly possible you know it wasn't something that was ever really that I can recall offhand that was ever really dedicated to, but like mm -hmm. you look at the, at the Vivane and sky point box set, you look at the Theron empire book. Yeah. Like those did allow to the potential that you could play Theron characters, mm -hmm. right. That, that provided more support for playing Theron characters than you might've had previously. Yes. You know, Theron's being sort of ostensibly considered kind of like the bad guys because of their 
uh, slaving ways. Heck, the protagonist of Shroud of Madness, mm -hmm. one of the Earth Dawn novels, is a Theron investigator. Now, a big part of the story is he becomes disillusioned with the way things are and kinds of like breaks ties with Thera and goes independent at the end. Hey. Spoiler. You know, all good there. <laughs> but Don't like, spoiler. you know, so, so I don't know. This was a very long winded way of saying no. Yeah. If, if what would I say is if you wanted to deal with spirits, then you should have chosen a discipline that deals with spirits. Because there's three out of the five magicians that do so. Yeah. A, so if you don't like the spell know. list, sorry. But B, I, as, as I said about the illusionist, I don't see that in their wheelhouse to talk to spirits. Wizards, yeah, it's, I mean, it's. I it's, think you're trying to understand the nature of the universe in a, in a uh, scholarly way. They're trying to understand it. And so I think their magic is more the physics as much as yeah, magic can be know, physics. And, and it's just, so I don't think they'd be talking to spirits either. You know, and it and it's not like we're in a situation where you don't know about the potential for spirits going in to things at the beginning. Yeah. Like it's it's like there's not a lot of detail on spirits in the player's guide, but the rules for summoning are there. The t the characters have talents that deal with spirits and summoning, the ones that can you know, the elementalist and the, the Nethermancer, and then Shaman, which shows up in, in Mystic Paths. But broadly speaking, if you wanted to deal with spirits, then take something that deals with spirits. Don't say, oh, I want to play a wizard, but I want to deal with spirits. Well, tough. That's not what wizards do. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's, it, I don't know. I, again, I'm not, it, I, I don't want to be dismissive of the question because I, I it's, it is a useful one question. for kind of, yeah, yeah, well, yes, it's a good, it's a good jumping off point for saying like, it is not a more open, like you've got disciplines. It is sort of a class-based system in that you've got niches and roles that each mm -hmm. discipline fills and a flavor and so forth that goes along with it. It is not a more sort of open style, more skill-based system like Shadowrun, mm -hmm. for example, to choose sort of the closest thing where you can take a character, you know, like basically any, I'm not up on everything in the most current edition, but basically if you are a magician of some sort, you can generally deal with spirits. Or that if you want to deal with spirits, you basically take the ability to deal with spirits. And there aren't really classes that delineate that the way that there are in Earth Dawn. And so my my reaction to that is not to be dismissive, but if you wanted to deal with spirits, then take something that deals with spirits. It's like if you wanted to fight in close combat, why did you take an archer? <laughs> like you are choosing something that is not designed to fill the role that you seem to want to fill. Yeah. And, you know, if, if that's the case that you thought that what you were picking initially was going to be more along the lines of what you wanted, or you realized that what you wanted was not, in fact, what you chose at the beginning, that's fine and perfectly valid and taste can change and totally. like your perception and whatnot, and you can rework or come up with a new character or, or work with your yeah. GM or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's all fine. But the the basic answer to the question is... If you want to do something, then take something that does it. Yep. Ta -da! <laughs> so don't mean to laugh at that one. Just it was a funny presentation at the end. So thank you, K. Scott. You sparked a nice little debate. We look forward to hearing more from you and anybody else who wants to chime in on this or any other topic we're going to talk about today. Yeah, 20 minutes in. So by all means, contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And we will be more than happy to... Respond rant in kind. for 20 rant minutes for 15 on. minutes on, on whatever you want us to rant on about or not. Because sometimes we give quick answers, but more often than not, we explain things thoroughly. So when well, we do our best. Yes. Uh, or sometimes our worst. No, kidding. For the rest of the podcast, we're going to talk about uh, something we've kind of hinted at a little bit before. And I think this would be helpful, helpful, helpful for players right now mm -hmm. on how to and what it means to weave your thread to a group pattern. Group patterns, yes. Yeah, this is a cool little bit of magic that is an extension of thre of like thread magic for for traditional magic items. Yeah, because I'll tell you, in the twenty five years I've known, uh, twenty seven years I've known about this game, and twenty years I've been playing this game. Because again, it took me seven years to get people to join in on this. <laughs> I have never woven a thread to a group pattern, and I've never had anybody actually make a group pattern to weave a thread to. Oh, group patterns are awesome. So. That being said, I know some of my players and some of my gaming group occasionally listens to this podcast, so let's enlighten them, shall we? Okay. 
<laughs> so a, a group pattern is essentially a deliberate creation of a magical object, a magical item that allows the people to gain power. And that magical item is a, rather than a sword mm-hmm. or a suit of armor or a wand, instead of being something concrete like that, it is a more metaphysical concept of a group, which is to say that we are individuals. We've got, say, our, our like, you know, our, our warrior. warrior and our Scout. troubadour and our cavalryman and our nethermancer and our, you know, like we've got this group that is united in common cause mm-hmm. and we are going to formalize that with, by basically performing a magical ritual and swearing oaths to each other and that we are going it. to be dedicated to each other and to this cause. Mm-hmm. And from that ritual, we then have the potential to gain, to, to gain magical power from it. That basically we are deliberately creating a true pattern. Mm-hmm. And through the knowledge of that true pattern, which we have because we made it, we can then therefore make ourselves stronger as a group. So it's kind of like the uh, Gestalt principle. We're stronger than the sum of our parts. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in some respects. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go with like the, uh, the Avengers as a very yeah, popular. Like, yeah. So, popular, so the, you uh, know, um, example. Yeah. That, that the, that the Avengers as, you know, again, like in terms of the 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 presentation within the the films or comic media mm-hmm. doesn't really happen. Yeah, there's no like real direct parallel. But the Avengers are a group. They have a name. They have a dedicated purpose. There are members of the group. Like you are either an Avenger or you are not. Yes. Right now, admittedly, in the comics, just about everybody has been an Avenger at one point, <laughs> at one point in time. Yes. <laughs> in the movies, not so much. We'll stick with that. Well, even in, I mean, in the movies, like, it, I mean, in At the end, end game, yeah. you know, <laughs> who wasn't <laughs> like Cap, Cap said the words, they were all. Yes. Um, but anyway, but like the idea is like, like taking the first Avengers movie, right? Like the Avengers are Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, Hawkeye, Black Widow, and the Hulk. Yes. Six. Seven. I think it was the, the six in the, in the first. Yes, 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 yes. We're good. The six in the first movie, right? Yes. So those are, they're not the same as the original Avengers from the comics. We know that. Who cares? Go watch YouTube. <laughs> so like those are the Avengers. And by being the Avengers and coming together as a group, which part of the thing of the movie is them doing that, right? Yes. They are, they become more powerful. They become more effective working together and acting in concert towards their goal in this case of, of fighting off the invasion of alien entities uh, in New York City. Yeah. And so the idea of a group pattern in Earth Dawn is along similar lines. It's just a lot more mechanically defined in terms of the benefits that you can gain mm-hmm. from that, uh, that magical entity, that, that true pattern for the group, yeah. which really only exists as a concept rather than a, really than a physical thing. So let's play off of this. So since you are in the live play, Legends of Bar Save. Yes. Has that group made a group pattern as of the last, the latest episode? As of the latest episode that has been released? No. Okay. <laughs> it has, they have not. I will say that in the gameplay that we have done thus far for upcoming episodes that will release in the future, yes. We had mentioned early in the course of that, like when we first left the initial town where our adventures were set and our goal was to come back a year, you know, was to come back later to deal with the horror that was pretty clearly too powerful for us at that point in time. Yeah. We had discussed the idea, like basically the Redeemers of Sinoc as a name that we sort of gave ourselves. Mm-hmm. We never went through the formal process of actually creating the group pattern and everything that kind of goes along with that that we're going to yes. be talking about today. Yes. But we sort of do exist as a group. And by the time that you get caught up and we and and to the current point where we are playing now, we actually have created that group pattern and woven some threads and gained some some benefit as a result of that. OK, so let's talk about it as as though it has happened and has been released because people play podcasts at their own rate. So by mm-hmm. the time they listen to this one, maybe that one will have been released. So let's assume. Well, it has been. Well, I mean, we, I can talk, I can talk about stuff without getting into spoilers. 
that's fine. That's all I'm looking for is. Yeah. So, so I will not spoil anything that, that actually happens just in terms of talking about, you know, or, or even sort of describe the, the actual circumstances under which we do it, but just kind of talk in, in general using Virag as the example of one of the people that is taking part in creating the group. Absolutely. I figured we used the Avengers because it was the most popular movie last year, 2019. And just about everybody in the world saw that one. So if you haven't, go watch it first. Anyway, so that was our pop culture example to kind of draw you in so you can understand it. One of many. So let's now use an Earth Dawn example for the rest. And we'll use the Redeemers of Synoc from Legends of Earth Dawn to kind of set the table for everything else. So part of the true pattern is you have to name it yes and everyone has to agree on the name right and and we had come up with the name long before we actually created the the true pattern the redeemers of synox sort of became the name that the that that our goal as a as a group was to someday return to Mm synox and the care beneath the town and somehow find some way of freeing the residents there from the malevolent influence of zorg the yes. horror uh that was lurking somewhere within the within the care fair and so that was that was the name you know we came up with that name sort of well in advance of us actually forming the pattern but that that is the group's name gotcha and it plays right you know and it plays into because one of the one of the things that it talks about in there with regards to the name for the group is that the group the name should somehow reflect the the goals and or history or something connected to that's related to the, your the activities group. your your focus your yeah um purpose whatever yeah yeah no my my i i've been running a campaign for many many years in the old classic edition and the group has a name they have a symbol they just haven't mm-hmm. actually done the ritual yet and taken the, the legend points so yeah so we're we're two-thirds of the way there i guess so second part so once you have a name and you have to have a symbol Mm-hmm. I don't remember what we came up with as the symbol for the Redeemers off the top of my head. I couldn't describe the one my team, my group has because it's really hard to describe, but. Yeah, I, I think that we might have come up with something that pays homage to to Rusty's elf air sailor who yeah. died in those early adventures. Mm-hmm. I suspect that we might have picked something relating to that. But I honestly now put on the spot don't recall specifically. Fair enough. No, it's okay. It'll it can get sorted out. It, later it on. will be revealed when it when it happens. When it gets <laughs> exactly. So each member of the group creates an item representing the group and that character's role in it. Yeah. Um. What what you are doing with this because the group true pattern the group does not exist as a physical thing mm-hmm. that you would be able to weave the thread to directly like you would with say a magic sword. Yeah. This is kind of like a magical fossa, focus or foci. Right. You basically need to create an item that basically acts as a pattern item for that group pattern. And it is through that that the character ties threads to the group pattern in order to, to boost themselves. Mm-hmm. And the item should be symbolic or important in some manner. I will reveal that the item that virag uses as her it bends the rules a little bit in the sense that she did not usually you need to craft the item yourself um or sort of you know make the item or or something like that to have that significance but virag chose the doll that was given to her by one of by the uh one of the a little girl Mm -hmm. from new synoc from the town that when we were leaving left and, and she gave me this this doll and has carried it with her along the way throughout all of their adventures and is, you know, basically as a reminder of what she has sworn to, you know, sworn to do. Mm-hmm. And so that is the that is what she chose as the pattern item, as her as the representation of her within the, the group pattern. I will take that every day of the week because that story supersedes the mechanics yeah. of needing to craft it yourself. Don't care. The story is yeah, better the, than the mechanics. And, you know, and, and, the, and the importance of that item, that gift from this five or six year old girl to, to Virag is a very, you know, is, and, and also like the, the doll sort of representing the child 
and Virag being kind of a, of the den mother leader mm-hmm. figure of this group. Like there's a lot of like sort of symbolic and metaphorical significance to that item. And it was like, I knew fairly early on that when we got around to actually making the true pattern, that that's what I was going to, to choose. Yes. Because I could not come up with anything else that seemed to be appropriate for that. No, there's nothing better. There might be something else appropriate, but there's nothing better yeah. than that. So I will, nope, sorry, done, you win. So this essentially creates a minor pattern item, because mm-hmm. there's minor and major and true pattern yep, items. We, this we, is creating a minor one. Core, not core. true. Sorry. Core pattern items. I keep getting true pattern and core pattern item. Blah. Yeah. There, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, some, there's some finicky terminology there. Language, yeah. Okay. And then the group is named during a specific naming ritual which is the beginning of the formation of the group's true pattern as an actual entity Mm -hmm. in and of itself. So that is, it is a, it is a deliberate ritualistic magical act. The end result of which is the creation of a true pattern. Yeah. And And there is a, there is a structure to that. The, the rules lay out like, you know, what each member does and what their name is that sort of thing and, and it's yeah. kind of like a swearing in ceremony <laughs> yeah i mean it, it is it, a, it is a ritual it is an oath there is a blood oath that goes along with creating that it is the, is the, the power period. of that ritual and the the cost of the blood magic that goes into it that actually allows the creation of the of the pattern yeah and so the drawing of blood because we covered blood magic just a little while ago in an episode mm-hmm. that actually solidifies and helps make the actual astral pattern physical pattern it ties them to those objects because magic has to of course be focused on something so Mm -hmm. that ties the whole thing together ta-da you have a group pattern yep now what you spend legend points well yeah at at that point i mean basically at that point the the pattern is created you have the items that are there for a link to that pattern Mm mm-hmm what before we get into that specifics yeah part of the way that you can think of the group pattern in terms of the framework of stuff. We had talked about true patterns. Most people are really familiar with how they work as far as magical items, mm-hmm. right? Thread, thread items, swords, yeah. weapons, wands, amulets, stuff. whatever. Any kind of, any kind of magic item, thread item, like the, the rules are fairly understandable for that, even if, you know, some bits of it might be a little fiddly. Yes. But then you've also got the pattern magic interactions with people and places and if you have a named place like the Bloodwood mm-hmm. and you have a pattern item that is connected to that place, you can weave threads to Bloodwood to increase your abilities while you are in that place. Mm-hmm. And it's not identical, but I like to look at the group true pattern as a conceptual place that when you are at in that place, when you are in the group, mm-hmm. right, when you are interacting with the group, then you can gain the 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 potential Bonuses. benefits yeah. that weaving threads to that true pattern uh, allows. Um, and so to think of the group as a place that you operate within, but rather than a geographical place, it is a conceptual or a metaphorical place. But anyway, what you can then do is you can weave threads. And you can weave up to, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, up to five threads. You are correct. Each of which can be up to rank five. Yep. These are subject to the normal limits for weaving threads. Mm-hmm. So if your thread weaving rank is only rank three, you can only have a total of three permanent threads woven. Yep. And each of those can only, I think, be up to rank three. You're right. That part I don't forget right off the top of my head, but I think nope, that's right. right. Yeah. And so obviously subject to the normal limits, but you can have up to five threads, each of which is, is independently purchased and raised so it each has its own value this is a little bit different from normal pattern item interactions okay where mm-hmm. minor pattern items allow you to attach to one thing majors allow you to do three and i think core allow you to do five but it's considered just one thread when you do that correct but group patterns allow up to five threads each of which with its own rank and then you can weave much like threads to people or places you can use it to increase the effective rank of any talent, except thread weaving. You can't increase your thread weaving rank using a thread, because then basically the thread is paying for itself and it gets around the restrictions of threads. Yeah. 
It's like the, it's the fan creating its own wind. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's just basically a, you know, that's, you, you can't, you can't really, you can't increase your, your thread weaving rank as a result, but any other talent, you can increase any defense rating. Mm-hmm. You can d- increase your mystic armor. Yep. And your effective circle for the purposes of calculating your durability bonus. Mm -hmm. And I phrase it that way (laughs) because it's not phrased that way in the book. And there has been some question about if you increase your durability with a thread, does it increase your durability rating? That is, say, bump a warrior's durability from seven to eight. Mm -hmm. Or does it increase their effective circle for the purposes of durability? And it's the latter. So if you are a fourth circle warrior and you weave a thread to durability for the purposes of the bonuses that it adds to your death and unconsciousness rating, you are effectively a fifth circle warrior. There you go. Ta-da. And so that's that's basically how it works. Well, and, and one more, because there's, I think, new in fourth edition, you can actually increase your wound threshold. I mentioned wound threshold. You did? Didn't I? Oh, no, I said mystic armor. Yes. I forgot. No, wound threshold has also been yeah, the case fair. all the way along as well. Okay. I, I thought I was forgetting one. But, <laughs> yeah, but wound threshold as well. That is one of the few ways to raise wound threshold. Yes. So it can be awfully handy to do that for, yep. for certain types. But yeah, Virag, I think as of right now, has three threads woven. One to mystic defense, one to pretty sure spell casting. Which makes sense. And I forget answer. what the third one is off the top of my head. But basically, like, I am weaving threads to make Virag even more cool at the things that she does well. Yes, as you should. Another approach that you could potentially take is to um, use the threads to boost things that are not strengths for your discipline. Um, like, for example, uh, Virag could, like, you could, we- if you are a magician and don't get any physical defense bonuses, you can weave a thread to physical defense to yeah. raise your physical defense and make you harder to hit. Exactly. Um, that's something that you can do as well. But yeah, the the threads are a little bit pricey. Um, I think they're 300 for the first rank. You are correct. Wow, I'm doing well tonight. You are. I have the book right open in front of me so I can play along. Because uh, people who might be commuting while listening to us, I'm making sure that we actually have the <laughs> the book handy so they don't have to stop. So generally speaking, it is something that you look at when you – that most people look at when you get into journeyman circles just because cost of – it is it is a little bit more cost effective to just spend the points to increase your talent rank normally mm-hmm. than to boost it with a thread. Yes. But, but thread magic, group patterns especially, can be a very cost effective way to get yourself a little bit of an extra bonus, mm-hmm. um, especially getting bonuses from – to defense ratings and other stuff that are not quite as easy to raise as talents. Mm -hmm. But there is something to be said for, you know, when you've got your spell casting at rank six already. And so rank seven would be 1300, 2100, something like that. Right. It, you know, that you're looking at, at a couple thousand legend points roughly to get a plus one bonus. You're looking at a nice chunk of legend points anyway. You can instead, through a thread woven to a group pattern, spend 800 or 1600, right? Three, five, eight, mm-hmm. 1600 legend. Yeah. To get plus three mm-hmm. to your spell casting. And everything that is boosted by your spell casting rank is also effectively three ranks higher. Yes. So, you know, that they like increasing the duration of spells, increasing, you know, all sorts of stuff off of that. So, so group pattern magic is a very, very cost effective way to gain some oomph, some to gain some oomph when you hit into those, into those journeyman circles and or adding, getting bonuses to things that otherwise don't advance quite as quickly. Okay. Like defense ratings, wound threshold, mystic armor, all that stuff, durability. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. So for the blood oath that they have to swear as part of the group, they take two points of damage, correct? It is two points of permanent damage that lasts for as long as the group operates. Lasts. Yeah. Basically. So if your death rating And it's and it's and it isn't you know, your death rating goes down by by two points. Again, by the time you get into journeyman circles, that's probably not a huge amount. No, you look at like sixty four to a sixty two, maybe, or you know, sixty eight to or, a sixty six. Yeah, or, you know, de- I mean, depending on your on your and discipline you yeah. and and your toughness and stuff like that. For for magicians or specialists, it might be a little bit more of a consideration depending on what other blood charms and stuff you might have. But the you know, basically, the the oath is that you will not betray each other. Mm-hmm. Basically, it is a a group oath of blood peace. 
which basically means that you're not going to fight and attack or hurt each other. Or let harm come to each other. Or, or let harm other, come yeah. to each other. Yeah. So you're going to get that done. Yeah. And so you... The benefits you A couple of out. points of damage, you know, a couple of points of permanent damage, some role-playing restrictions, which shouldn't be that much of an issue. <laughs> you know, if, if your if group is along. not a bunch of... <laughs> yeah, if you're already getting along and your group is not a bunch of selfish murder hobos. <laughs> You know, that it, was my it group is, name, Selfish Murder Hobos. <laughs> we are the Selfish Murder Hobos. It's weird. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's you know, that, that's basically how it works. And the paths, which were introduced in Mystic Paths, are kind of a, a further elaboration on some of those ideas. Yes. But the idea is that, the, that a path is a much larger group true pattern mm -hmm. that is sustained and woven to by all of the people who follow that path. Yes. And that... You have sworn an oath to uphold the ideals of that path. In most cases, there are exceptions like the outcast warrior, for yeah, example, fair. or the outcast and whatnot. But like that, that's the idea behind the, the paths is that it is a group true pattern and allows you access to boost stuff that way. Yeah. Yeah. Which we'll the, get into later. The, narratively speaking, some obsidian, Narratively speaking, broadly speaking, Obsidian are somewhat reluctant to make blood oaths because of the magic of uh, their connection with their life rock. They may, yeah, they, the brotherhood their brotherhood, life. they may find it, they may be uncomfortable with the idea because it's possible that their, that their brotherhood might be held to an oath and whatnot, that their oath to their to their life rock, to their brotherhood, even if it isn't necessarily formalized as far as blood magic, that their commitment and their bond and their oath to their life rock supersedes any other kind of oath that they might take. And I have heard horror stories of game masters being jerks because of, you know, like basically being jerks to to Obsidian characters or those players. players and whatnot. Yeah. There is nothing to narratively, there is nothing to mechanically reinforce that. And if you've got a, you know, if you want to kind of explore that direction as and philosophy as an obsidian, you know, it might just be a case where you take your party to the life rock or you just accept yeah. that you might be missing out on some potential mechanical benefit and not swear it. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, that that is something that is a role playing decision. And as long as you go into it with open eyes and recognize the the potential downsides of that, you know, that's cool. Uh, I yeah. I don't want to say that, oh, no, Obsidian never do this, because that's something that is cool and flavorful and thematic, and it should be available to people that want to take advantage of it. You know, but not everybody does. In my, um, one of my early long-term... <laughs> Clearly, I just said, we've been yeah. playing for 20 years, and none of my people have actually done like a group pattern. Like, in, in my Riders on the Storm campaign... That, that one of those first long Earth Dawn campaigns that I ran, they did form a group pattern, but the elf, no, he wasn't an elf, I'm sorry, the Tiskrang archer in the group Solar did not partake mm -hmm. in the in the group pattern or the group thread. He, in fact, I think left, um, the player kind of left the game eventually before the, the rest of the game broke up. But yeah, like he did not, as a character, want to, to do that, which was fine. Hmm. Fair enough. It's everyone's choice or not. I've got a group that, like I said, wants to. They just haven't actually explored how to do it, what the benefits are, and if, if it would behoove them to do so. I know yeah, it would behoove them to do so. It's just a matter of the consensus hasn't it, – it, it was happening, and then everything came together, and then we lost a member of the party permanently. That is a – yeah, that is a are. potential problem if any member of the group dies – um, then the group pattern um, will break apart. And so the the options yes. are either to bring the individual back to life or to basically get together the remaining members and swear a new oath um, and basically reform the group under the new, like you can, you can sort of add and remove members because the, the oath is ostensibly just for a year and a day. And so the group only yeah. lasts as long as you continue to to swear that oath. And so there is nothing that requires a group pattern be permanent. And you can potentially add or remove members from that as uh, as time goes on. Yeah. So we'll 
re-explore that one. I hope that flushes everything out for everybody else, including myself, because like I said, I was always a little bit uncertain of all of exactly how all of that would work because the rules for group patterns come after the rules for using thread items and I never put yeah. the two together. So anyway, that was just me and my failing of reading it. That's all. No, it's I Nothing mean it's there. it's kind of in there with the more nebulous and potentially difficult to follow rules for general pattern magic with with people in places as opposed to the much more mm -hmm. clean cut magic item stuff. And so, you know, much like yes. other stuff when you're talking about patterns and threads and things like that can be a little bit, a little bit confusing. Yeah. So that was all it was. So if you just remember to treat your group pattern like a magic mm -hmm. item. Yeah, basically, like, like you know, you basically uh, sort of think of <laughs> the, the, the threads that you weave to a group pattern, uh, similar to the way that you would approach the bonuses that you get for weaving threads to a magic item. It's just that instead of being predefined mm -hmm. based on the item, you get to choose what what you want to boost. You want to boost, yeah. So that's all it would take. And I already know where each single one of those players, uh, characters, would have their boost. I already know that. I already see Because I'm the game master for that whole group, so I, I know exactly what they would be going for. Well, we're 50, 45 minutes in. You want to cover game master awards? Yeah, briefly. I wrote a blog post about this for the, um, for the FASA Games website mm, Not too long a few ago. months back. Fair. Where basically I, I I talk about sort of under the hood why the 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 recommended legend awards in the Game Master's Guide are what they are mm -hmm. and kind of where those numbers derive yeah. from. But but generally speaking, when you are running a game and you are getting to the end of a session or the end of an adventure, because legend points are what allows the players to advance their characters. You need to. Yeah, it's like player money. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is. It is character advancement coin. <laughs> and so you basically need to to award them for, you know, it's like experience points in, in other games. But it's but there it yes. is a resource that is then spent to advance your character, uh, whether that is by increasing talents or attributes or bonding magic items, weaving threads to group patterns, you know, all of those wonderful things that you could potentially spend those legend points mm -hmm. on. You know, and that there are spells, certain blah, blah. things that are recommended that you give those awards for meeting the objective of the session or adventure, overcoming obstacles in the course of mm -hmm. meeting that objective, whether that is standard like mm -hmm. combat or bypassing traps or finding some other way than combat to to get past something that that might be obstructing your your path to your mm -hmm. goal obtaining yeah. treasure that is connected and allow, and would allow you to perhaps show to people that you um overcame these these objectives frequently these are like bits of creatures or monsters that would potentially have other value you know, like if to choose a ridiculous sort of example, if you were to kill a dragon, taking the the teeth or claws or something dragon scales or scales from the dragon as an indication of, look, we have this, we, you know, as proof that we defeated this, this opponent, in addition to having whatever potential kind of alchemical or, or valuable magical ability it might have. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that could potentially, you know, not, not just simple coins, but like if you retrieve a famous or legendary item from a care, yeah. that item could be a, a, something that awards legend points uh, above and beyond for the objective. And then sort of a miscellaneous role playing slash story goal, yeah. um, like like, you know, basically can deciding whether individuals or the group as a whole entertained each other in the course of, of role playing and, and playing their character and things like that. Yes. That's one that's a little bit more nebulous and some people have, have issues with that I'm not going to get into here. You know, some people don't like the idea of giving out individual, like different awards to players um, for role playing because that favors more outgoing or actory types of players mm -hmm. over those who are a bit more staid or whatever. Yeah. And I, to a certain extent, agree with that um, in much the same way that, that I am kind of in favor of at least leaning in part on social mechanics, because I don't want to penalize people who are more introverted or reserved or whatever, Yes, you know, in that regard. 
So that, but that's sort of just like a, a general, like additional award that you can provide to the group for like a, a fun factor. And then, you know, like if, if you are completing a larger story arc, maybe providing an additional benefit for achieving an adventure objective as opposed to a, a singular session adventure uh, objective. Yeah. And then the, the amounts, you know, there's a range given with an, with an average amount for each of those awards. And then the table shows like what the total award would be based on, you know, if you were to, to give the minimum or maximum value for, for all of those. And the numbers on that chart were basically developed to, to, to roughly speaking, advance characters at a certain rate. You know, basically we crunched some numbers a while ago. Um, figuring out what the absolute minimum number of legend points required to advance from circle to circle was. And then basically looked at that and said, okay, well, how many Mm -hmm. sessions do we want it to take for them to go from this circle to this circle? And obviously build in a a fudge factor because there are things other than raw talent advancement. Because in addition to going from first to second circle where you have five talents that you need to raise to rank two – you also have an optional talent. You also might want to raise skills. Yeah. You might have a magic item that you want to weave a thread to. You might want to raise attributes. Like there are other things that you could potentially spend spend legend points on. And so there's yes. a little bit of a fudge factor built into that in terms of that. But basically going, okay, we assume like it's going to cost this much. We'll build in this fudge factor, divide it up by how many sessions we want. And this is roughly speaking how many sessions it's going to take. Um, and so the... The table, the numbers on the table, I think, are yeah. roughly calculated to take a character from a brand new to 15th circle over the course of about two years of weekly play. Maybe, you know, obviously it will, you know, could potentially mm-hmm. take a little bit longer as you have more thread items and various stuff beyond raw advancement that you might want to spend legend points on. But that's sort of the the very rough guidelines. And that's just kind yeah. of built on the idea that you want to have, you want to give the players some sense of advancement and achievement as they go along. And honestly, the amount of time played, like really long running campaigns can vary and how often people can meet can vary. And so you want to Mm -hmm. have enough of a, of a fudge factor. If you've got a group that's meeting more frequently, but you don't want to advance quite as quickly, then you just give smaller rewards. And that's why there's a range there. And if you are meeting less frequently and you want to, you know, advance a little bit more quickly, you give the alert, you give larger awards. And that is something that you can vary over the course of, depending on the on the pacing. I mean, it does not take much to get from first to second to third circle in general anyway, even with the le- recommended legend awards that are, that are there. They're kind of built along the, like, a couple of sessions, you know, fairly quickly to, to be able to, to reach that. And so you can certainly uh, give the amount that you want, but the amounts that are in the book are ones that were, roughly speaking, calculated to allow what we think is a rate of advancement that will allow players to feel like they are making progress, even if they don't necessarily achieve a circle every, you know, very frequently. And as you get higher in circle, that that becomes less and less frequently because there's mm-hmm. just more stuff that you need to raise. It slows but down. the awards, yeah. like you should be able to raise a talent or maybe raise an attribute or weave some mm-hmm. thread ranks. And you're like, there should always be stuff that you can do with your legend points, with your available yeah. legend points. Fair enough. And do it at a pace that feels like, you know, every couple of sessions or every adventure, you can have some downtime to spend those and increase things and yeah, go from there. Because I've got, I'm running a weekly game at the moment, just as a kind of pickup game, because we're all in still semi-imposed quarantine. Two players, and I'm running a shard, a pre-written shard, so it's very few Legend Awards to get through that whole thing. So it's not very long. It's not very complex. Mm-hmm. So they're second circle. I'm giving them like 200 each session just to show up. And play and play the character a little bit. Yep. And that's right in line with that chart. 100 to 300. Legend Award. Go. 200 on average because they're both second circle. Yep. And then, of course, they defeat the monsters and they get their Legend Awards for those things and the creatures. And they get extra you know, points for solving the problems along the way and so forth and so on. So, yeah, it's you will get points, period. And you may not circle up after every single adventure, but you will get close. Or you'll get halfway to the next one, depending on where you are in your progression. But you'll you'll make yeah. strides toward the next. It's 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 kind of designed to advance through those first couple of circles relatively mm-hmm. quickly, 
so that you can build a reasonable pool of talents and abilities. Because as we've talked about with the various discipline discussions that we've had over, you know, the, the, the episodes here in the past, a lot of times you don't, for some disciplines, especially you don't get really the full effective mm-hmm. suite of abilities until you've gotten into like second yes. or third circle just because of the number that are available and, and whatnot. And so it is kind of geared to advance through those first couple relatively quickly. And then especially once you get into journeyman circles, things then, because at that point, you've really got you've got a, a significant boost, you start getting things like group patterns, more thread items, you know, and other stuff that you might want to spend points on. And while the awards do get a little bit bigger, your advancement is likely to yeah. slow down. So which brings up the you know, a little yeah, bit, which, which is fine. Up the following two questions, which is how much money, silver, gold, whatever not should, you know, gems and whatnot should game masters hand out as well, along with the legend points, because they will have to pay their yeah <laughs> instructors. I am personally of the opinion that you should give them enough money that they should be able to advance when they yeah. are ready to. And I am not such a huge fan these days of tracking Penny. every no. copper piece. You know, there are people that, that like doing that. I just don't need the players. I just need the characters, you know, dragging a, a trunk of change behind them to pay the next uh, instructor. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, obviously you can sort of shift some of the some of the raw silver value for favors and, and things like that if you want to. But I am mm-hmm. of the, the feeling. And there's another I'm pretty sure I did a, a a follow up to the Legend Award one about silver awards. I think you should. Yes. Generally speaking aim to have the characters have earned or found enough money in the course of their adventures to be able to pay to be able to pay to circle up when they can circle up and be able to buy some extra stuff that they want because i you know unless you are running a, a a style of game where you are intentionally like in the same way that you could be playing like a, a survival wilderness exploration game where you are paying a lot more attention to things like food supplies mm-hmm. and environmental concerns and things like that. You know, you could be playing a game that is much more penny pinching um, in terms of the group needing yes. to scramble for that. And that's a perfectly valid way to play. It's not my particular cup of tea style. You know, I yeah. like to, you know, make sure that, you know, keep them a, a little bit hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, but but I think that uh, unless you've got some real reason to withhold money from them, look at how much it's likely to cost them to increase. Divide that by how many sessions or adventures you expect it to be before they can um, advance. Build in a fudge factor for living costs and have that yeah. sort of be the general guidelines that, that you work by. And I think I maybe broke down some of that as an example in, in the, the column. I'll have to well, go yeah. and check that and up. I'll put it in, in the show notes if I can if I actually did. Fair. And never forget as a game master to uh, start charging people. Make sure you charge them room and board during the downtime. Yeah. Make sure you charge them the instructor's uh, proper fee. And that, oh yeah, my character's got so much money. Yeah, well, did you pay for everything? Because, you know, you, you did downtime for a month. Pay for your room right. and board for a month. Take that out and start whittling that down just to go, you don't get to keep all your money all the time. So one of those things. And then which brings us to the last one, what kind of items? Um, that is... Can you yeah. have, should you... Maybe hand out and find and I know that's a whole, let's, a let's, whole other let's show. Table that, <laughs> let's table that as a as a more in depth discussion for something else because we're we're now at a, at an hour, um and you know when we're talking yeah, about fair. items we're you're talking about magic items you're talking about thread items and there's a lot more to that discussion I think that that needs to be that needs to happen fair. so we'll 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 table that for another time. That's fine by me. I have no problem with that whatsoever because that is a whole lot more complex of an item and fewer yes. charts. Because the legend point charts is one thing. You've done a blog post about the silver items of any kind to hand yep. out, be they uh, minor items, just thread items, or superior magical items. You know, way big, deep conversation we're going to wade into. So, other than that, folks, we have covered uh, threads, some email, some group patterns today, what you can do with that, how to bonus it, and, and exactly how to go about making your own group pattern with your fellow players and everyone should actually benefit from that. So if anything was unclear, rewind it, play it again three or four or five times, whatever, until yep. you get it down. Uh, it took me 20 years to more or less understand it and spur my players to do the same thing. Yes. 
other than that, any final thoughts, anything we missed? Um, no, I think that, that, that covers things, um, pretty well. There's, there's some, some cool stuff there. And, um, you know, group patterns are something that, that really like some other aspects of earth on really shine with a longer term game. Um, yes. you know, with a longer term campaign, I do not have that as something that is built into like the, the characters that I make for the convention one shots and stuff that I do, because there's mm-hmm. no, there's typically not a lot of character history and whatnot that, that plays into things there. Cohesiveness might be a little hard yeah. to come by. <laughs> but especially when you get into journeyman circles, some of, like many of the creatures and whatnot were built on the understanding that many groups will have group patterns and the, the benefits that can come about from that. Mm. And so, you know, we talked about like gauging the, you know, it's not a problem if they don't, but it's something that you, you know, when you, when you as a game master are putting together encounters or scenes, you know, we'll yes. need to take a look at, um, the numbers and just make sure that um, things are, are kind of balanced out for an appropriate challenge based on what you want the scene to be. All right. So other than that, folks, uh, we look forward to any questions you have on any of threats, this. group patterns, money, legend awards, and or GM the advice. items we might be bringing up. Yes. Any kind of GM advice or player, or player advice, advice. Any of yeah. all of that. So we will be here in the returning future. We have many more things to cover, so we're not going away anytime soon. 32 episodes deep. Otherwise, folks, it is time for you to go make your own threaded legend. Good night, everybody. 